Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we have Rory on who is a vet. Hi Rory, how are you? Hi guys, yeah I'm great thank you. Good, good. So do you want to tell the guys a little bit about what you do? So yeah, as you guys pointed out, I am a vet. I work in South London uh, as as a companion animal vet which essentially means I treat dogs and downwards, as I put it. Um, so, yeah, anything smaller than a Great Dane, I suppose. Um, it's, uh, I've been a vet for five years um, and uh, I, I work in, uh, I've worked in the same place for the last four years. And I think it's, I, I'm biased, but I think it's the best job in the world. <laughs> so what, what made you choose um, a career in, in veterinary medicine? For me, there was literally nothing else. Um, I, uh, there's this really romanticized story that my mum tells, but, um, without, without making people sick, um, <laughs> it, it basically I was, I was four years old and, and we got, uh, we got our first ever dog. Um, and she was a, the most amazing great Dane. Uh, she's a blue great Dane and she was called Lulu. Oh, they're beautiful uh, dogs. Oh God, don't, are, are you guys dog people? Do you, do you have dogs? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, uh, I've got a Jack Russell. Well, kind of, she's a, she's a bit of a mix um, nice. and a Cocker Spaniel. And yeah, I've always had dogs. They're, no, they're fantastic. West Highland Terrier. Very large oh. West Highland Terrier. <laughs> large because they're meant to be large or large because. <laughs> he's a, he's a very large West Highland Terrier compared nice. to any other West you've ever come across. <laughs> oh, awesome. Nice. And um, sort of cross Great Dane, maybe. I th- well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we think can, but may- maybe Great Dane. No, nice. can't run like it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, so realistically, yeah, we 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 we. I was four years old, uh, and we 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 got Lulu and picked her up, and we took her to the vet as you do, sort of new puppy, take her to the vet, um, and we walked into the vet, and it was this like com- converted house, uh, proper James. Do you, if I say James Harriet, do you guys know who James Harriet is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like that James Harriet style veterinary really old school like the the vets just like come off the farm like muddy hands and just like proper like romantic veterinary as i would put it yeah. um and we meet this guy called mr benson who to this day is still the vet for my animals at home oh wow uh like 24 years later he still looks after our dogs our family dogs so he yeah he, he's like he was one of the most control like uh when someone goes into a room and has a presence like he was he was that guy like he had this booming voice he's only about five foot six but he had this like booming <laughs> voice and uh and he was just immediately in control of like of, of lulu and was like amazingly excited by her and i was just in awe and i just sat in the corner of the room with his first visit and uh and was just like yeah completely in awe i got to listen to her chest through the stethoscope and all these sorts of bits and pieces mm. and uh and yeah ever since that point it was it was i want to be a vet and uh and that's not changed well that that never changed all the way through school and and, and 24 years later i'm sitting here as a vet so were you able to obviously knowing what you that you wanted to do that tailor everything you did um to reach that goal yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think I think veterinary is one of those careers, um, and there's a number of them out there. But I think it's one of those careers where you do have to really decide early um, and 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 go for it. And, and I think that really puts you in good stead to then be able to do what you want to do. Uh, I think that probably goes for any career, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, from the age of about twelve, well, I, I say. I, actually before that I mean from the age of about eight I was helping on farms um I was very lucky to live in the Cotswolds so I um I basically was on on the farm from from as early as I could be and so I was helping with lambings and and and, and the cows and the pigs uh and wow, what it, way to grow up oh, Cotswolds is stunning as well so it must yeah. be amazing oh uh, it, it, it's yeah it, it's what I call my spiritual home um mm. and it's uh I was very, very lucky to, to, to be, be there. Um, and yeah, so then through school, it was just a case of, of, of picking what I needed to pick and, and, and making sure I was well, um, well aware of, of, of the requirements and, and, and what I needed to do to get through to vet school. And, and yeah, for me, it was never, it was never a question of what if it was a question of, yes, of course I will do that. Did you, did you find it hard to attain the grades that you needed? Cause it's, it's quite stringent, isn't it? To get to, uh, you know, into vet school and the A-levels you need are, are quite high grades. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of the it's one of the highest highest requirements I think of of, of most university courses. Um, it, I mean, yeah, don't don't get me wrong, it wasn't easy. Um, but I think to be to be to be honest, if you if you put your mind to it and, and it's something you you want to do as much as I wanted to do it, um, there was never a question. And 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 yeah, don't get me wrong, I failed at points, and and I I will happily hold my hands up and and say I had to retake exams and and particularly through uni I had a, a couple of really bad years when I basically didn't didn't pass a single exam um and and but it, it's it's all about the, the tenacity and, and and keeping on that track and, and and believing in yourself that you can actually do it and what was your vet school experience like how did you get on there were you uh excited from day one or was it incredibly hard Oh, how how PG are we, guys? No, I'm joking. That's <laughs> um, no vet, oh, vet school. Vet school was, I think, vet school splits people. Um, uh, it's 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 a weird experience. I don't think it's any. I don't think it's anything like any other university experience. I went to I went to the Royal Veterinary College, which is oh, wow. part of the University of London. Um, but because of that, it it only does veterinary. Um, so you are a cohort of two hundred people who are all studying veterinary there are two other courses and one is veterinary nursing and one is biosciences and they're about 50 people so essentially you spend five years socializing with the same group of 250 people all of whom are animal lovers and want to do the same thing which is a odd experience um (laughs) but also special and yeah i absolutely loved it it was it was mad but amazing so obviously working with animals there's hundreds of thousands of different animals species out there and you've this you sort of have to be everything a doctor can be but for a very right range of animals going through university did you have anything to help steer you towards um obviously you said a great down great down and below um towards that sort of style of veterinary or was there other aspects you could have gone into yeah i mean that's a great question and, and i think it's something that um a lot of people wonder sort of when they're thinking about this sort of thing you, you have to train exactly so for example if you sat a room and you had a, a a vet that's looking after zoo animals a vet that's looking after horses a vet that's looking after farm animals and a vet that's looking after the sort of animals that i look after every single one of those vets studies the same five years no matter what okay. and they they all graduate with the same degree basically what happens is in your last year or two you start to tailor your experience towards what you want to do and a lot of people don't decide until they they graduate. So you can sometimes split it. So you're like, okay, well, I might do want to do farm and I might want to do horses. So I'll do a bit of both. Um, but so much of the course in the last couple of years is experience based and being out and about with qualified vets. Okay. You essentially can pick who and where you go and spend that time with. Um, so I picked to be in small animal clinics. I picked to be around the Cotswolds because that's where I was um and essentially yeah tailored tailored my learning to what i wanted to be and how many years is uh veterinary school it's five years so uh and yeah. is that including those um those years of uh work experience sort of thing yeah it is so uh, everyone thinks veterinary seven years um, yeah i thought it was seven i'm not gonna lie yeah, yeah i don't know i actually I... thought i thought it was the longest uh degree actually for some reason yeah everyone seems to think that and i don't know whether that's historical or I mean, honestly, if I had a pound for every time someone said to me, oh, seven years, it's longer than a doctor, um, yeah. I'd probably have about 100 quid. Um, <laughs> so, no, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's a weird one. I, it, it is five years, unless you go to Cambridge uh, and you're a glutton for punishment, so that they do six years. Um, you can make it as long as you want. I mean, I've got a mate of mine who spent 12 years at the Royal Veterinary College. Um, 12 years? What was he doing? Um, yeah, he did. He did his. Did he passed his exams. Or? <laughs> yeah. He did twelve. He did. He did his vet degree of five years, and then he did a PhD on top of that. No, sorry, masters on top of that, and then a PhD on top of that, and then like a, another year. I, yeah, it was very weird. Wow. Um, he just he just didn't want to go to work. <laughs> you know what? That's exactly right. He was essentially a massive child and wanted to pass the time. <laughs> like, but he just stayed at vet school. Um, so how did you actually get started? What was your first sort of real job in the industry? 
So I, I got a job before I qualified, which is quite funny. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I had a job offer in like the May of 2015 and I didn't actually find out if I passed my exams till July. So that was a tough few months. Mm. Um, not that I started the job, I just got it accepted. Uh, but yeah, I, I started at a, a, a vet's in Kent and it was a 24 hour hospital. And essentially I worked shift work. So it was either an eight or 12 hour shift and it was either during the day or overnight and I could be working any hour of, of the day um and i wanted to do that i want uh, i think when people come out of vet school they 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 want to either two things they either want an easy life and they want to go and do a standard like 10 hour day four day a week because that's a standard week for a vet um or they want to go and do shift work and basically hammer themselves and learn really really quickly which is what i wanted to do because mm. i knew that i didn't want to do that later in my career um so yeah, I was basically working nights, seeing emergencies, and it was scary as, but it was awesome. How come uh, you said it's uh, 10 hours a day, four days a week? It's, yeah, yeah, vets work a lot. Um, yeah, well, I, it was for 40 hours, but obviously most people do 40 hours over five days. Just seem so reason vets do it over four? Uh, because we have to be open those times. So um, okay. the majority of vet clinics will be open from seven or eight o'clock in the morning until seven or eight o'clock at night. Right. So my current shift pattern, uh, so full time at my clinic is, is, is 47 or 48 hours. Okay. Um, and it's four 11 hour days and then a Saturday every three day, every three weeks. Okay. Um, and, and then that's not including things like on call as well. Yeah. So going back a little bit back to your university days, um, we actually had your colleague, Dr. James on um, uh, last week, I think. I heard. And I meant to ask him this, but how did you um, deal with or learn to deal with the sort of blood and gore that goes with, you know, the operations and all that side? Because um, I actually wanted to be a vet when I was younger and I did some work experience at a... Uh, a I local, remember this story. <laughs> yeah, at a local vet clinic. And I'd been there for about two days and it was fine. And I'd watched a few operations and it was great. And then this South African vet came in and did a spade on a fem- on a, obviously on a female dog. Yeah. And um, next thing I remember, I was on the floor, um, pretending. Uh, apparently, I said, "No, mum, hang on a minute, five more minutes, and I'll I'll get out of bed." <laughs> I just passed, passed out. out absolutely <laughs> like a stone um, at, at the vets. Did you sort of have any experiences like that, or were you okay with the blood? You know what? I wasn't far off. I wasn't oh, really? far okay. off. Um, just to put put this, uh, just you mentioned James. He is the single most squeamish vet I've ever met. Really? Anyway. He, so he, uh, he has a really sensitive nose, sense of smell. And uh, if you ever want a, a laugh, just get something that stinks and put it in front of him and he starts <laughs> working through it. It's, his, his gag reflex is hilarious. Um, I, so when I, was, um, when I was, what, 12, 13 maybe, I was in the uh, vets for the first time with Mr. Benson, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and I was actually watching a, a cat spay, so uh, not too dissimilar. And I had a very similar experience. I, the sort of the room went a bit blurry. I started to feel really, really hot, mm. and I basically, yeah, started to collapse. Didn't actually pass out. The nurse basically put an arm around me and walked me out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had a very similar experience. And you know what? I at that point, as a twelve, thirteen year old boy. I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to be a vet. This is like with my dream. I'm not, it's, it, I can't do it. Um, so I was really shaken by it. But Mr. Benson then pulled me back into an, another op of the same thing. I was like, what, what are you fussed about? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with you? And I was like, okay, well, yeah, I suppose, yeah, it's, it's not normal. And then from that day on, I was fine. Oh, really? Okay. Is that common for a lot of people, obviously, happened to Dan you sort of yourself um do you hear other stories like that absolutely I, you know what I've got stories of mates of mine who fainted at uni I mean they've got that far they've got yeah. to like they've got to the vet school the, that that's the that's the tough bit right you, you you've gone through all the exams you've got into vet school and you, you're on the course and then I yeah I've I had I had one mate of mine who um who was holding a horse's leg during surgery so they're all scrubbed up fully sterile like quite like a big surgery 
and it, and it was always like the honor to be able to be involved in these surgeries like if you were the picked student right mm. so you're know, the chosen one um <laughs> and uh and i remember just standing there and watching him and he he was sweating buckets um uh, both from pressure and heat because you're in a like a gown that just doesn't breathe um and he just i watched his eyes roll back in his head and he just fell backwards no um, and, and, and the surgeon the surgeon was just like oh I'll leave me be fine <laughs> <laughs> and oh, it, was, it was hilarious do, is it a case of becoming desensitized to it once you've seen it a few times you're kind of well okay it is what it is i think it is i think i think it's I think it's just associating it, to be honest. I mean, for me, as soon as I'm in surgery, the animal is no longer there. It, it's, it's the surgery in front of me. Um, as soon as the gowns go, as soon as the drapes go down, I mean, you'll have watched medical programs and stuff. Like yeah. you, you, drape, you drape over the animal. What you've got is a small field of view. No matter what it is, that's the job. That's yeah. not an animal anymore. So for me, I, I just associate. Okay. Mm. Um, so what would be an average day for you uh, these days? Oh, okay. That's a question and a half. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a bit of a slacker. I only work three days a week now um, because I dabble in some uh, other bits and pieces. So um, as James does with, with the television yeah. work and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, but in the clinic, I, so yeah, go in, uh, it's an eight, eight, eight till seven usually. Um, get in and you do consults between eight and 11 o'clock. And, and I'm very lucky that I get, I get 20 minutes for my consult. So I get to give my clients a, a really sort of uh, thorough, thorough consult and we get to have a nice chat. Um, I, there's vets out there that work five minute consults and I have no idea how they fit it all in. Um, but yeah, we, we consult for three hours uh, and then I, I go and I do my surgeries for the day. So the surgeries can be anywhere, but anything from, dentistry to, to x-rays to ultrasounds to small procedures such as uh, little little wounds and stitch ups and things like that or, or, or nail removals or um yeah anything of, of that sort of nature um, all the way up to to open abdominal surgeries to remove foreign bodies things that dogs have eaten because they're silly um <laughs> or yeah all sorts so uh that's super varied and then we consult again at the end of the day between about four and seven and then yeah home and what kind of uh, job is it is there a lot of traveling involved i guess this will depend on what type of vet you are if you're a farm vet obviously you'll be going out to loads of different farms um but how does it work really for for you guys in the consulting world yeah you're spot on um if you're a farm vet or an equine vet um yeah you're in your car probably the majority of the day to be honest which a lot of my friends who are far more equine vets absolutely love because they just get to chill and listen to podcasts and radio and all that <laughs> um little plug for a podcast um <laughs> so uh but yeah for us in the clinic it's um i mean yeah we're there all day right i i must admit it's rare i get a lunch break more than 15 or 20 minutes so it's 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 pretty wall-to-wall busy um from the moment i walk in it's coffee in hand and go <laughs> um but i think that's probably variable clinic to clinic um but yeah it's it, but the, the thing i love about it is the variation um no no two days are the same yeah um, you can get boring days you can get days when you're just vaccinating dogs all day every day but you also get days where you've got some of the most weird and wonderful things and amazing people and amazing animals and it, yeah it's great do you how rewarding do you find uh, the job it's everything I ever wanted to do. So it, I, I, I genuinely drive into work and home with a smile on my face, even if it's, yeah. and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not trying to oversell this. Like it, there are days where you want to go home and drink a bottle of wine or just cry into a pillow uh, because you've seen some absolutely horrendous things. But at the same time, it's, super fulfilling and super rewarding and i wouldn't change it for the world we were actually talking to to james about this about sort of not the dark side but this sort of maybe undiscussed side with with the veterinary world and uh, the amount of people sort of dropping out now after a certain period of years and um sort of depression rates and i guess uh, you sound like you know you've always wanted to do it you love it you love the animals how do you actually deal with that sort of darker side to it I love that you brought that up and I love that you spoke to James about that. It's something that I am 
massively passionate about. Um, I actually, it's the reason that I don't know if you guys have seen, I, I wrote a book um, mm. and, and it's the reason I wrote that. It's the, the, the reason. Life of a Vet, was it? It's the secret life of a vet. The secret yeah. life of a vet, yes. Yeah. So uh, I'll send you guys one. Um, you, you give me oh, a, fantastic. A, Thank you. Um, it, yeah. The, the whole point of me writing that was to raise awareness of this because it's sort of the veterinary world's dirty little secret in a way. Yeah. Um, all vets are aware of it. All nurses are aware of it. But but actually, your clients really aren't. And I'm sure you guys as dog owners aren't aware. Of, well, weren't. No, until James, we spoke to James, we, we had no idea. Exactly. So... I'm sure a lot of my clients have no idea. And, and, and in reality, it, it's absolutely horrendous. I mean, you've got vets who are four times more likely than the general public to commit suicide. You've got absolutely sky high rates of depression, burnout, uh, compassion fatigue, whatever mental health issue you, you name, I guarantee you it's rife within the veterinary profession. Mm. And I think that unfortunately goes hand in hand with the kind of profession it is. We're dealing with extremes of emotion. We're dealing with horrible circumstances sometimes you're dealing with money pressures you're dealing with all sorts of things um client expectation your own expectations um and me personally going back to your question because i've just rambled about other stuff but (laughs) going back to your question about how i deal with it for me i have healthy ways and unhealthy ways of dealing with it Mm. unhealthy being as i aforementioned the bottle of wine um (laughs) and or beers um and the healthier ways of exercise and disconnecting and just managing my mental, my own mental health, because I have a very fragile mental health, but I have learned so much about it over the last yeah. five years being in the profession. Um, and I think, you, you, yeah, it, it's trial and error, right? You've got, you've got to surround yourself with good people. You've got to surround yourself with a good support network. And um, if you're lucky to, enough to have that, uh, then that makes it a lot easier as well. So you said you uh, you're only working three days a week at the moment. the The rest of the week, what are you doing? Uh, is it and is it to help your mental health? Yeah, I so I, I made that decision at the start of this year, last year. I, I can't actually remember. That's really bad. Um, yeah, it's right. It's been a funny year. I won't worry about it. Then. <laughs> it's been a very very weird year. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I made the decision. Um, yeah, a, a while ago now because essentially I found myself with without enough hours in the day and and not enough days in the week to do everything that I was wanting to do. And that was really significantly affecting my mental health Um, because I was stretched and I couldn't provide the service that I wanted to provide both to my clients, but also to the media work that I was doing. Um, And, and you know what I love, I love being able to work three days a week and being able to support myself with the other stuff as well, because having such a balance between the serious, the, the and my dream job, as, as you guys have, I'm sure, heard. What sort of personality traits do you see in yourself um, and others around you who, who are in the industry? That's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> I think, to be honest, I think this ties in with the mental health stuff. To it does, real. yeah. Because I think veterinary actually does attract people and this is no criticism to vets but i think it does attract people prone to those mental health issues yeah i I think that's i mean i've seen it in other industries i think one of the biggest things is because you're doing something you love so much yeah i mean you're absolutely right and and when you care so much about what you're doing and you put so much of yourself into your career i think it it does take it takes the, the smallest thing to really knock you yeah um i mean the the kind of people that are vets it, workaholics um people who are unable to switch off um i mean obviously hyper intelligent people uh, are there as well i think to be honest and uh, the veterinary industry will forgive me for saying this uh but people uh, vets are forgiven for lacking social skill occasionally. Um, <laughs> that can come with the hyper intelligence, though. Exactly, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? Right, You're, a lot of a lot of the guys going in. Uh, sorry, guys and girls, and and it's such a female dominated profession as well. A lot of the people going into veterinary are so in tune with animals. I think sometimes they 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 do better speaking to animals than humans. Mm. 
I guess that, you know, you have to be that way. You know, you're trying to, as I said to James, you're trying to diagnose a patient that can't tell you what's wrong. So, you know, it's incredible how you do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, doesn't it? Um, it does, yeah. It's like, it's, like, it's like putting a piece of kitchen paper on the surface and asking it what's wrong. Yeah. Um, it, it's a weird one. Um, but it, it, it's, we're, we're essentially like detectives. That's, yeah. that's how I think of us. Because it's, it's learning the signs, learning what to look for when and, and, and picking up on those patterns. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. And as I said, it's, it, it's so variable. So for you, what are the biggest positives and opportunities you've taken out of your career so far? I mean, you're on the real pets factor on the BBC. That's incredible. You've just written your, your first book. Um, and you've got quite a, quite a big Instagram profile. You know, these are all great things you've taken from your career. But what are the biggest things for you? Yeah, I, I absolutely owe my career f- to, to those things as well. And, and, and I'm very lucky to be in a position where I've, I've managed to do that. Um, I think for me... My biggest achievement to date will always be my veterinary diploma, my my certificate saying that I'm a vet. And I don't think anything will ever top that. Um, mm. Because I mean, uh, because I think that for me was such a long term goal and, and a childhood dream that, yeah, I, I, I would struggle to name too many things that would top that, that mm. are, reachable um i mean other things i think I, i'm super proud to be uh, involved with the pets factor i think we are doing a great thing with regards to educating kids and getting kids excited about animals and excited about veterinary and excited about looking after animals and good animal welfare which is really the reason we do it yeah mm. well you've done uh, eight series which is incredible yeah I, I i honestly if you told me that when back in 2017 when we started it that we do eight series i would have laughed you out the room um but yeah i mean you've spoken to james the group of vets on it um myself not included are just awesome they're, they're, <laughs> it's a great it's a great thing to be a part of and i'm very lucky to be um so that i mean I, actually when we were nominated for a bafta that was pretty cool yeah uh, yeah did James say that at all? No, he no, didn't he mention didn't. that, actually. No. Oh, there we go. Oh, see, I, I'm, I'm far too egotistical. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the BAFTA was pretty cool. Uh, we didn't get it, but we got nominated and we got to go to the kids' BAFTAs, which was um, it's one of my favourite photos of me and James, actually. It was, it was, it was a really cool night. Um, but yeah, I think, I think for me, the, you've got you've to focus on the, on the little, little things and the little achievements. Um, so really, it's when I feel like I've done a good job and I've, and I've helped someone with their animal. Um, and it can be as little as someone coming into the clinic panicking or worrying or, I don't know, about the smallest things like yeah. vaccinations and just talking them through it, holding their hand and, and, and getting them to walk out of that room 100% happy with their decisions and, and, and much more confident as, a, as an animal owner. Sort of speaking about opportunities within the, the vet world, I know you, you deal with, um, you know, Greyhound and, and Down, um, but have you ever thought about maybe going abroad and, and, and doing some, I don't know, work in Africa or, or something like that, maybe a bit of conservation work or do those opportunities exist once you're a vet? That would be amazing. I mean, I think that's pretty much everyone, every vet's dream, honestly. Um, the, the, the opportunities are out there. I think you've got to be pretty lucky to get them. They are, they are few and far between. Uh, and there are thousands and thousands of vets, and probably you can count those opportunities per year on one hand. Okay. So y- you're talking small amounts. I mean, don't get me wrong, I could go to Africa and try and find some stuff to do, um, <laughs> but I'm not sure that would go very well. Uh, yeah, maybe don't just turn up. <laughs> yeah, just rock up at a, Yeah, a, send an email first, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> just rock up at a safari and be like, hey guys, uh, yeah, do you need help? <laughs> I'm a vet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I've got mates of mine who've gone to Australia and, and gone and, and done some amazing things, but uh, yes, I, in, a, in a word, yes, I would love to do it, but equally, I think you've got to be super lucky to get those opportunities. And, and for people who want to do that, often the zoo jobs, uh, going back to the sort of the getting there. I know one person who's a zoo vet and I was speaking to her about it. Um, and she basically was, was streamlined and, 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 and bred for that role a little bit um, all the way through her schooling and into vet school. She mm. knew the vet who was the vet at the zoo. He had almost 
earmarked her as his replacement, like 20 years okay. in advance. Wow. And, and it, it, it's zoo vetting and, and exotic animal vetting is a little bit like you've kind of got to replace someone because it's mm-hmm. quite a saturated thing. Um, so if you, if you are someone out there who, who, who really wants to do that, you've, you've kind of got to know someone and, and, and really plan ahead and almost make your choices and moves to become that person. How hard do you think it would be for you to, if some emergency came up and you were called into a zoo and you had to operate on, I don't know, say a lion, for example, would you feel confident in doing that? I guess anatomy is anatomy to a certain extent, but. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, it, yes, particularly with cats, because, because we've got the domestic cat and I deal with them day in, day out. Yes, mm. I think lions, tigers, all that sort of thing would be great and I'd probably be fine put me in front of a giraffe Ooh, maybe not um <laughs> yeah i'd probably want some help with that one uh yeah it, it, yes i think to be honest in an emergency situation you've got to give it a go right mm, uh, mm. but and yes i would probably be better equipped than say a doctor um yeah. or a lawyer um <laughs> so, so yeah i think that'd it, be an impressive lawyer <laughs> can you imagine just whipping out a scalpel yeah, yeah stand back guys i got this uh yeah so i think yeah it would be it i, I would be very nervous um and that's the pg but though. you'd be able to transfer those skills yeah i, I don't see why not I, I think i think i think there's um realistically in an emergency situation with a human and there was no doctor reachable then vets technically are allowed to treat humans okay i was talking to someone today actually about this and i don't know if this is true but you you can as a vet you could probably operate on a human but a a doctor would really struggle to operate on an animal yeah absolutely yeah and weirdly the law stops doctors doing that oh does it yeah so so doctors are not qualified to operate or treat animals whereas vets are the second line of defense almost. So it basically goes, and, and, you, and I don't know if you've, you've seen it with the COVID thing. Um, vets have been very, very close to being called in to do oh, hospital really? work. Wow. Um, there, there, there was a huge Facebook community um, right at the start when there was a shortage of, of medical professionals and they were calling back all the people who had retired like five years ago and all that sort of thing. Mm. Vets were next on that list. And you guys are super lucky we weren't called in. <laughs> we take temperatures the bad way. Yeah. <laughs> it's only one. Yeah. Okay. Um, just going back a bit to when we were speaking about um, the zoo and having almost a mentor, how, how important is it after coming out of university and sort of going into the different types of fields you can go into to having a good mentor and finding one? I don't think it's a hundred percent necessary, but it blooming well helps. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't in my first job, uh, honestly, and that's probably the reason I left. Um, yeah. and I've settled in my second job and I've been there for four years, as I said, right at the start of this. Um, so I think when you've got someone you click with and who can, who can really help you grow as, as a, as a vet or whatever you are, to be honest, I think a mentor helps in all aspects and every career. Um, it really does help you accelerate and, and be confident in yourself and, and learn well. Um, you've got to pick the right person as your mentor. I definitely have people who, or mates who, who've been in practices where they've had a mentor, quote unquote, um, who's not been the best vet in the world. Uh, and they've ended up doing some slightly dodgy things. But um, yeah, I think it, it definitely helps. Uh, but it's not, not 100% necessary. But um obviously for your uh, more the GP side, but going into more exotic and maybe rarer animals still potentially uh, not, not so necessary. No, I think that becomes, then it becomes really, yeah, uh, that that's as far as I'm aware. And, and to be honest, I'm speaking probably out of my comfort zone here. Cause I, okay. I don't know, but I would assume, yes, you would need someone to help you really take, take you under their wing. Yeah. Because to be honest, you either need, it's not stuff that's taught to you as a baseline at university. No. So you can't really come out of university and just be like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Um, it's going to be something that you're going to have to really get into. And yeah, absolutely. A mentor in those aspects in the, in the slightly more weird and wonderful worlds. Um, yeah. That, that becomes much more, more of an, uh, of an issue. Okay. We've obviously uh, spoken a little bit about the uh, darker side of the, um, the industry, uh, but what would be some of the other less favorable um, aspects of the industry in your job? Poo. <laughs> 
Uh, no. Um, I suppose... That's a fair comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, poo, wee, pus, blood, vomit, other bodily fluids that you don't want on you. Um, but for me, the biggest, if we ignore the, the inevitable death and all that sort of thing, the biggest thing that I struggle with is the finance of the industry. Um, and that might sound weird, but I'll explain why. The, 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 fact, the sheer fact that we have to charge for our services as vets yeah. and we have a reputation within the general public as money grabbers and overcharging and expensive and whatever words you want to use. For me, that is the biggest downside to being a vet because it brands you with that and you're constantly trying to live that down. Um, You're constantly trying to cut people's bills. You're constantly trying to undercharge people. Whereas actually we don't, we charge appropriately for the services we provide. It's just, unfortunately, people don't understand the cost of, of medical treatment. Yeah. Um, the NHS. Do you think a that's a UK thing? I was, I was that, sorry, just about to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're spot on. You, yeah. you're, you're, you've gone a, down the exact right line there. And I, I think, I think it's a world over thing and don't get me wrong. Vets are expensive. We know we're expensive, but we, we're the rest of the world have an, don't have an NHS to right. compare and I think with that, something it's to. It's compounded in the UK because of the NHS. And don't get me wrong. I love the NHS and I will shout their praises from the rooftops until the day they privatise. However, they don't half make vets up lives hard. Um, it's, it's a really hard thing to try and explain to people how much medical care costs when they get it free. Yeah. Is there any, any way um, in the future you could see of like an NHS maybe style for, for veterinary? I suppose never say never. I think mm. to be honest, uh, is there ever going to be a tax system that, that pays yeah, for I'm that? Saying, no. Our tax is going to go through the roof if that happens. Right, yeah. right exactly. Uh, there's never going to be a, a, a centralised government way of doing that. What mm. I can see happening is a revolu- revolutionisation of the insurance model. Mm. Um, I personally think the veterinary insurance model, yes, it's great and it, and, it, and it allows people to afford life-saving surgeries and all that sort of thing. However, it's expensive and it's a bit flawed in my opinion. Um, I think the future looks very different in veterinary. I think subscription models are going to become a thing. I think, I think it's going to change. And I think almost, yes, you're right. It's going to become a, a way of all of your veterinary care is free apart from this extra subscription slash tax you pay. Mm. If you want to think of it as a tax. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I do think, I do think things are going to change. Interesting. So talking about finance, actually, we uh, went away and looked for some stats of average earnings. Ooh, um, this is interesting. Yeah. Um, so a starting salary uh, for a vet can range really between 20 to sort of 25 after they come out of vet school. Yeah. And then with experience, maybe five to 10 years experience, you're talking um, 35 up to sort of 45,000. If you go any higher than that, you're looking at sort of a manager role within um, a large vet practice. Does yeah. that sit right with your experience? Yeah, that's, that's about right. Those, those numbers are about right. Possibly, you probably possibly 5k low maybe on those, but, okay. uh, but I've always worked in London, remember? So um, I'm, that's probably why I've got that. Mm. Okay. And what would be something that's uh, not in the job description that you uh, uh, have to deal with? Although, you started from such a young age, you probably knew everything that was going to come your way, really. Yeah, I think for, for, for me, the, the biggest thing that, that shocks, especially new vets coming into it, is the, is the clients. Um, you're, you're always kitted out to treat with the animals and, 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 and look after the animals. It's, it's the client expectations and the crazy things that people request uh, that you've got to deal with and, and, and sort of blindside you a little bit. Um, I mean, I had one person ask for their dog's teeth after a dental because they wanted to make a necklace. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. People are weird, guys. I, I, I don't I hate to break it to you. Um, they're wonderful, but they're weird. Um, <laughs> I mean, I suppose going back to the finance thing and, and touching on those average earnings. What do you guys think of that? I'm going to. Sw- we both thought it was very low. Numbers. We thought vets were higher higher paid than that. i have to admit when i was looking into being a vet all the figures i saw 
where once you've established yourself, you're looking at, you know, a hundred grand as a vet. So hearing that from James and yourself and looking up the stats, I was really surprised. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was always told when I was a kid, um, I don't know how old you guys are. I'm 28. But when I was a kid, I don't know if this lines up with you. I was told exactly that. I was told, yeah, mm. you can easily reach six, six figures yep. as, a, as a vet. Yeah. It's, that's a complete lie. Um, I, I don't know any non-specialist, non-business owner vets that are on anywhere near that. Do you um, think that's changed? Do you think it's changed since we were growing up? I think it has. I, th- I think the, the reason being that veterinary is now a corporate land. Mm, okay. um, it, it, the Instead majority... of having the one in each village owned by the vet sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing, right? If you, are, if you are the village vet and you treat all the animals in that, in, in that area and you tr- look after the farms, because that's, that's also the thing that's changed, there are very few mixed animal vets anymore. Um, as I've told you guys, I treat dogs, cats, and, uh, mm-hmm. and other small animals. Vets, when I was growing up, treated everything. They treated horses, they treated cows, they treated sheep, they treated dogs, they treated cats. They treated because men. you were the village vet. Yeah. Exactly. So in those instances, yes, I, I see how those businesses could be turning over large amounts of money. But nowadays, because so many vets are owned by corporate companies, those, the actual vets themselves do not get paid the, the money that, that people expect. And that goes, again, back to, you asked me what my most, the, the most difficult thing, well, one of the difficult things about being a vet was, and it's people expecting that you are paid, they're coming into the room and expecting you're paid 100 grand. And actually, yeah. when you're paid... 28 yeah that's a hard that's a hard thing to change Mm, you constantly feel like you're justifying yourself to these people you think you're on x amount but you're not exactly and i mean honestly i'm quite i'm quite lucky that i've got really good clients but the amount of comments and snide remarks that Mm. people make to vets about oh i'm paying for your new car the amount of money i've spent in here could have bought your house and like it's just it's just it, it's just not true and and i think i don't it's frustrating um and i think you'll you'll be hard pushed to find a vet out there that isn't frustrated by it um mm. but yeah you're absolutely right with those figures uh, most vets i know are paid in the, in the 20s to 30s wow so what does the future look like for you rory are you heading back to the cotswolds and opening your own traditional vets practice or what what do you want to do with the future in this that's a lovely thought, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think I'm 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 good in London for now. I I, I think the next two years will be there. Um, I'm still finding my feet with with the the extra what I call the extra bits. So so the, the media work, uh, yeah. and London is definitely the place to be for that. With regards to veterinary, yeah, I, I we've talked about the corporate, and we've talked about the finances, and all that sort of stuff. I. I'm going to shed a bit of positive light on this. I think the era of the independent clinic is coming back. I okay. think I think people like an independent. I think people like the idea of going to their local vet that's been there for 20 years. Mm. I think they like the idea of the money going into a local business. Um, so my gut feeling and my, I, I absolutely hope it, I'm right, but my gut feeling is that the era of the independent vet clinic is coming back. Okay. And if that is the case, then yes, absolutely. There will be a vet clinic with my name on somewhere in okay. the countryside, uh, <laughs> hopefully in the next 10 years. Wow. Well, I was, I was going to say, actually, once you are a vet and you're in a surgery, particularly in these corporate style surgeries, I assume the ceiling, you can't really progress there's not many like levels you can go up the chain until you actually open up your own uh business yeah absolutely i mean as far as you can go in those corporate places so i i I currently work in a corporate um that was bought out last year it was originally an independent Uh, i as far as you can go is is a clinical director or what's called a clinical director which essentially means you're the boss right so in that building you are the highest ranking person however behind the scenes there are 17 different tiers within companies ha- the, the company house mm-hmm. so it, yes and and unfortunately the the, the both the salary and the, the time commitments reflect that um I, the only way to really be in ownership of your career and your future and be really in control is to 
own your own place or do something different. And that's, I think that's the other thing I suppose we should touch on slightly. And I know we're a little pushed for time, but um, is what else you can do with your veterinary career? Because by no means doing a veterinary career, do you need to be a vet? Um, I have friends who are chicken vets, cow vets, horse vets, uh, pet vets, but I've also got friends who work in the home office. I've also got friends who work okay. in abattoir. Yep. I've also got friends who work as advisors for the government and, and, and as civil servants. Developed medicine. Who... No, this is the, yeah, there is hundreds of things you could potentially right. get into. Exactly. I'm, I'm working in labs and, 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 and all sorts of things. Um, so I've also got a mate who might have switched onto a law degree and, and, and now does veterinary law. So all and they all have the same degree that you do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's such a variable degree. And the other beautiful thing about it is if you, and I've got a friend of mine who really didn't want to be a vet once he started doing the vet course, but graduated. And now you, that degree, because it is so transferable, he works in finance in the city. Yeah. Um, and so it's a really good degree to get. So would you still go into the industry knowing all you know now? Yes, is the quick answer and the honest answer. Yes, I would. Um, but would I want to be a vet full time for the rest of my life? Probably not. Okay. Is that because of sort of the mental health side of it and you're so emotionally invested in it? Yeah, I think it's the stresses. I, to be honest, I think if I worked as a full time vet, I'd either have a mental breakdown or I would end up leaving the profession. Because yeah. or both, because I just don't think it's a, at least in the role I'm in and the the role that ninety percent of vets are in, it's just not a uh, what's the word the a maintainable uh, thing. It's just not um yeah, it's not a doable thing. Do you think they are now starting to talk about the sort of dark side of it and the, and the mental health side of it enough to to make changes? Yeah, hundred percent. And there's uh, some amazing charities coming out that would work. Um, massive shout out to people like Vet Life, who are providing twenty four hour helplines, a bit like the Samaritans for for vets. That's a um, great idea. Yeah, it's 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 awesome. And because because the, the the thing is as well, and this is no discredit to to people who are married to vets out there or, or friends of vets out there, but the blunt fact of it is you don't understand you don't understand what it's like. You don't understand what the stresses are. You don't understand how emotionally draining it is to lose a patient that you've been working your ass off to try and save for six months. Um, and yes, it's great to have a sounding board and my absolutely browbeating girlfriend who listens to my whinings of work. Um, she does an amazing job of supporting me, but at the end of the day, quite often I actually need a vet to talk to. Mm. They understand. It's, yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Which they, I think they, is a, a good time to actually say, if anyone is out there struggling, please do reach out to someone. 100%. And that's the thing. And, and, and the, the biggest, I, I signed my book off. It, it, I, 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 the last page basically says, we need to start the conversation. We need to continue the conversation and we need to stop so many talented, amazing, excited people entering the veterinary profession and all other professions coming to a, a demise or leaving the profession or just not fulfilling their potential because it is an absolute crying shame. I, I kind of, I don't want to end on a, on the, on the negative, but cause there is so much positive to be, you know, you love your job, you get to work with amazing animals and it is a fantastic industry. It just needs to evolve. Right. Absolutely. And, and change is coming. Don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a hundred percent positive about this because these conversations and these sorts of things, podcasts and, and blogs and, people chatting in the street and my clients coming into me and going, Oh yeah. So I heard about this and just the more education we can get and the more ch- sort of conversations we can have about these things, the better the situation will be, the mm-hmm. more support will, that will be there. The, the, Cause I don't, uh, I don't know about you guys. For me, talking is everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, so my, it's the starting my, point for everything. A hundred percent. My, 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 parents and my friends and my family they know there's something wrong with me when i stop talking to them Mm. and i think that is is essentially the key if you are struggling or if you are out there and you're you're having an issue 
talk to anyone, talk to someone that will listen, just grab at anyone. Um, but that is happening in the veterinary profession. And as I said, vet life are amazing. People are asking those questions. I, I have people come in. I mean, I, the other, it was about three, four weeks ago, one of my clients came in and was like, are you okay, Rory? And <laughs> you know what? That simple question mm. was so refreshing and it just put a massive smile on my face because I think particularly if we can learn one thing from COVID as well, we've got to look out for each other and we've got to be there for each other. And that is happening in every industry, but absolutely it is happening in the veterinary industry and, and it, and it is, a, is a great time. That's great to hear. So thank you so much for coming on, Rory. It's been fascinating to chat to you. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. It's been really good. Thank you again. And uh, where can people find you on Instagram? And do you want to say the title of your book once again? Yeah. So the title of the book is The Secret Life of a Vet. It's in Waterstones and Amazon and all those sorts of places. And I am Rory the Vet on all social medias. So yeah, give me a follow and uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Rory. Brilliant. Best of luck with the book, Rory. Thank you.